I don't know if you guys remember this. Uh, I was raised in the 80s, and in the 80s, uh, this was all the rage for um, physicists and flies. This, this is, of course, uh, uh, you know, from the movie The Fly with uh, Jeff Goldblum. And uh, um, I put this picture up because I know that as physicists, we're often uh, very loath to get into uh, things like uh, animals. Uh, of course, you know, this is a perfect example of that. It, it didn't end up uh, very well for Brendel Fly, uh, you know, at the end of this movie. And so uh, it, it's with great caution uh, that someone like me, who had never really uh, worked with animals uh, before, uh, tried to get into this field of insect flight. Um, and I'd like to share with you some of my experiences. And really, a lot of this is going to be driven by uh, the things that were developed by Sam Whitehead and uh, Eunice Kinkabwala in my lab. And so uh, to them really goes most of the credit for, for the developments that, that we've had. Okay, so these slides are um, essentially going to give you a little overview of the fly as a model system, but it's for non-experts. Uh, I've collected a few online resources that you'll be able to go back to in the recorded video and, uh, and, and tap. And, and those are really the, the ones you should read to figure out how to get up and running. But I wanna give you a little bit of the basics here. I will not go into the molecular biology um, and I will uh, uh, really just try to give you a, a top-down picture um, uh, of what this is like, uh, a fly lab in the, physics, uh, in the physics building. Okay, so why Drosophila? Well, when I first started my uh, investigations, I actually started with a little crustacean called, a, uh, I don't even remember what it was called, but it was something that you had to dig out of the ocean and we could only get it, uh, you know, in the summer, ostracods, that's what they were. You could only get the ostracods in the summer and, you know, they were amazing little creatures. They swam like this, but the problem is we just couldn't get enough experiments done. Now Drosophila, they've been developed in labs for a reason. They're super easy to work with. They're easy to handle. They have a short generation time. They have stereotype behaviors, some of which we'll talk about. Um, there's a dozen, dozens of analysis tools that have now been developed for Drosophila. There's a lot, a huge collection of stable lines of mutants, um, access to powerful genetic techniques, um, especially the libraries now developed by the Howard Hude Medical Institute, and the infrastructure to, apply, to obtain the, the flies and materials is already set up for you. And so once we started working with flies, we understood why everyone loves these animals. They're super easy to work with. Um, there's, very, there's no IRB protocols because they don't have a spine. So you can get started right away. I'm not condoning that you should do bad things to them, but I'm just saying that the hurdles are, are low for getting involved in this kind of research. This is kind of the life cycle of the fly. Um, uh, you basically have an embryo that goes into first, second, and third instar. It has a pre-pupa stage, a pupal stage, and then it hatches and is ready to go. And all of this happens uh, you know, relatively fast. The genome of the fly is actually 60% homologous to humans, which means that you can actually study diseases that show up in humans in a fly. Um, and that uh, is nice because again, like I said, the fly is often a much simpler version of more complicated higher animals. And so if you can figure out um, what's going on in the fly, oftentimes it becomes a good working hypothesis for people working in mice and, and higher organisms like, uh, like primates. Okay, so some fly basics. Um, the larvae grow in vials. So the lab, at least one of the lab uh, rooms is full of vials like these, where the flies are um, eating this cornmeal, this mush. Uh, they climb up the walls and they e-close. I'm not sure if I have any e-closers here. Um, and uh, they e-close about after two weeks. Uh, the adults are, are transferred. Uh, you essentially uh, flip a vial uh, to new food um, and uh, you can anesthetize them with cold or CO2. Um, and then that allows you to uh, sort them under the microscope, males, females, uh, different, uh, different uh, uh, offsprings uh, using a little simple paintbrush or a little pooter tube that you have that can allow you to pick them up and place them in the different vials. Um, uh, they can be bred uh, by separating the males and the females sh shortly after they eclose, 
and you collect the female virgins. Um, the equipment that you need is really cheap. So to get started with uh, a fly experiment, uh, you, you need something like this. Uh, it costs you about 300 bucks. If you want fluorescence to go with it and dissection, you might have to pay a couple thousand for that. Uh, you have a little uh, incubator, that's a couple thousand, few thousand. Um, if you wanna do fly uh, flight experiments, free flight experiments, then you might need to construct uh, an apparatus or buy a few of these phantom cameras. Um, these cameras have become much cheaper and with flies, you only need about 10,000 frames per second. So you're not really pushing these to the edge. So you can do this for uh, about $30,000. You can get a full setup. Um, let's see. Uh, then you got to learn a little bit about breeding. Um, so this is uh, some of what we do in our lab. Um, breeding is uh, very well developed in flies. They have a short generation time of about two weeks, like I said. And uh, sample handling, simple handling is, has led to extensive libraries. So um, a classic experiment was to put these flies uh, in a dark light, uh, so half dark, half light environment. Um, you just wait for the flies that naturally go to the dark uh, to, to come over here. You look for the flies that naturally go to the light. You go over here, you separate them, you keep breeding them. And after a few generations, you can get flies that naturally move towards the light and other ones that avoid light. Um, so originally mutant lines were found by experiments like these and by mutating uh, uh, through radiation and chemicals. Uh, but nowadays we have ways of introducing viruses and genetically manipulating them that are much easier. So um, uh, this is a mutant fly from uh, Mothra and Godzilla days. Um, but the idea is that through these more modern techniques, uh, we can generate not just uh, uh, fun, fun movies, but also flies that can uh, really have big behavioral differences. So there's cheap date. Uh, this uh, fly has uh, a change in its sensitivity to alcohol. Uh, it's used to study uh, addiction. Um, we have fruitless, which exhibits uh, mating behavior uh, with the opposite sex. Uh, we have uh, a fly line called amnesiac, which reduces the ability uh, to make memories. Um, we have a clock fly, which has different circadian cycles. And you can imagine how useful these lines are for studying fly behavior in all sorts of different contexts. Um, it's really, really amazing. Uh, and, and this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Now, most of the modern uh, breeding happens using, using systems like uh, the GAL4 UAS system. And again, I'm not going to go through this in extraordinary detail, just to say that by um, having a protein that essentially um, is, uh, when you combine the GAL4 and the UAS system together, that protein uh, codes for ion channels that are light sensitive in a neuron. And so by shining light on that neuron, you can open the pore and essentially depolarize or activate or deactivate the neuron. Now, by separating the GAL4 from the UAS system, you essentially allow yourself to make genetic mutants with the GAL4 system, make ones with the UAS system, and by breeding them, you can get crosses that have only rarely both of the components in the same neuron. And that's how you're able to really screen out the lines and create very, very targeted mutants which allow us to manipulate very specific uh, neurons uh, just one at a time. Uh, there are other systems like the Lex-A, Lex-A-Op, uh, Q systems. A bunch of these are coming online. Um, they're really powerful uh, genetic tools for doing the kinds of perturbation experiments that I showed you in the previous talk. Um, you could uh, have the UAS genes uh, code for fluorescence. So you can take a fly, this is what it looks like in bright field, but you could just as easily make it fluorescent. Now you can keep track of the flies that have a particular uh, genetic mutation. Um, you can cross those genes with other uh, 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 GAL4 uh, uh, mutants that will allow you to fluoresce individual components of the um, fly in different stages of development. Um, you can take the genes and you can uh, make the flies essentially sensitive, if you can target the genes for smelling carbon dioxide, then by shining light on a fly, 
you can essentially get them to think that they're smelling carbon dioxide. And that makes them move away from the light. So these mutants here, uh, in this video, where you have red here, you're shining light on them, and you can see they move away from the red zones. When I switch the light, all of a sudden, uh, what used to be black is now red, now they move into the black zones, and you can see their density changes. When you do this with wild types, nothing much happens. And so these flies essentially flee from red light because they smell carbon dioxide or they think they're smelling carbon dioxide. And we're using these flies to do population dynamics where you put flies that can smell or see the red light and smell carbon dioxide on one side of the room and then run to the other side and maybe vice versa to see how crowds react when they uh, go past each other at a mosh pit or something like that. Um, again, uh, there's a lot that you can do with these libraries once you develop them. So I want to give you just a few minutes of, of what we're doing with the library that we developed with this collaboration uh, in terms of testing hypotheses. So these, again, are some of the 200 lines that, that we uh, put together. And I want to show you how you might organize uh, these in order to generate hypotheses that you would then want to test in behavioral experiments. So for example, you could look at which neurons are just next to each other, and you can try to cluster them. And so for example, um, this cluster has a bunch of neurons, um, and this one in particular, the VUMI, has projections. In other words, it, it connects all of these different uh, parts. It connects the neck neurons, the wing neurons, the haltiers, the tectulum. Uh, it connects the AMN, which I have my little cheat sheet here is the uh, accessory mesothoracic neural pill. It connects the uh, MVAC, which uh, I don't think I even put that on here. Okay, I, didn't, uh, I don't have my cheat sheet. But the idea then is that uh, you can look at the fly anatomy and actually look at what these different sections are. So like MVAC is this brown part over here and AMN is this part over here. It's at the bottom of the fly. It's near where the legs are. And this then connects to the neck and the haltier and the wing motor neurons. And so this kind of cluster suggests that it's responsible for like a takeoff behavior where you're essentially uh, kicking the legs and then flapping and adjusting your, uh, your sensory apparatus to allow you to take off in a particular direction in a stable manner. And so you can do this kind of clustering all over uh, the flies. And then you can ask, um, how are these little clusters connected to the descending neurons coming from the head? So in this particular case, this is a neuron called DNPO6, doesn't really matter. It's a sister to the giant fiber. And it comes down from the head and it connects to cluster number nine pretty strongly. So that's this connection over here. And cluster number nine has a lot of neurons that connect between the legs and the neck and the wing and the hall tiers, just like I talked about before. And so this suggests that this is a very controlled takeoff mode that allows you to kick your legs in a controlled fashion, start beating your wings and uh, adjust your head motions and connect with the hall tiers to essentially guide the, uh, the takeoff behavior. If I look at this cluster though, cluster number 10, which is uh, connected to the giant fiber, DP01, what you see is that it has very few connections. It, it just looks at the leg and then the wing and the tectulum. It bypasses the haltiers. It doesn't care about the head. This is basically a get the heck out of there uh, uh, circuit, which essentially just means jump the heck out of the way and start, and start flapping. I don't care what the heck's going on. And so this is the way that you can start taking these libraries and forming hypotheses with them which you can then start testing in behavioral experiments. And it's a very powerful way for starting to uh, make progress on these ventral nervous cord um, neurons. There is an entire library of such flies in the Bloomington uh, Drosophila Stock Center. You just uh, call them up, order the flies that you want uh, with the behaviors that you want. They ship them out to you, most likely on your campus. There is a fly group that is willing to help you get started, and you can start doing experiments with these, with undergrads uh, even, um, really quickly. 
and seeing some beautiful behaviors. And since there's so much to investigate, um, it's likely that there's a lot that um, still needs to be learned. So let me show you some of the beautiful fly behaviors that people have been going after. And this is a very small subset of, of what uh, people have done. Uh, people have looked a lot at courtship and mating. Uh, it turns out that fly courtship and mating is very stereotyped. Uh, it starts uh, by tapping um, uh, a female uh, and then scissoring. Uh, that leads to some mid-leg swinging uh, behavior. Uh, a little proboscis extension, uh, what's known as a nuptial gift, which I think is a little bit of um, uh, throw up material that uh, the male gives to the female to kind of pre-digest it. Here you go, you don't have to digest this anymore. It's ready for you to swallow gift. Uh, you get wing extension and then uh, attempted copulation. Um, so all of these steps, um, there are now mutants uh, that allow you to target the different steps in these. And you can imagine the cascade of neural circuits that needs to be activated in order to do each one of these behaviors. Proboscis extension is a whole neural circuit just for the extension and control of that proboscis. And so figuring out how you cascade from one to another is just amazing. There's a lot of work that's um, been done on foraging, just watching what flies do in new environments. So there are different uh, uh, personality types. There are flies that just like to sit around. Um, and so if they're fed, they might explore a little bit of their environment, but not very much. Whereas this rover type fly um, will go a, a much larger distance. And that uh, uh, also changes dramatically depending on how many uh, hours it's been since they've been fed. Um, there are flies that uh, exhibit very aggressive behavior. Uh, this is a slow motion video, had a lot of attention in nature of one fly attacking uh, another fly. And uh, in case you're, you're worried about that one, don't worry. Uh, he gets uh, his little uh, front legs up and, and starts skewering the other one. I mean, this is uh, reminiscent of the debate that we had recently. And so you can imagine how studying these flies could give us insight into the political theater that is uh, happening uh, these days. Um, Flight, which is my favorite uh, behavior. Uh, this is the movie that I showed you before where we now have mutants where we can shine light on them and, and get them to do little backflips. But just flight on itself is so spectacular to watch as these insects perform these figure eight wing strokes back and forth um, uh, through the air uh, as they move forward. Or in this particular case, uh, this insect had its wing half cut off. And you can see that it's doing just fine flying and maneuvering. How do insects learn how to fly in these different behaviors? Again, a fantastic uh, behavior to, to explore and investigate. Um, and so in all of these uh, uh, cases, uh, this is uh, where you'd want to start using the, the fast kind of cameras. Um, and now we're getting into looking at groups of flies and crowds behaviors as these flies uh, congregate uh, in different arenas. Um, there are a ton of experimental tools. I see my time is running out, so I'm going to briefly go through these. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, micro CT from the Wolfner lab showing the details of what happens during population. Um, this is a video showing uh, a CT uh, movie of a fly. Again, the kinds of details that you can now get are stunning, just absolutely spectacular. The muscle structure and the digestive system the reproductive system, uh, the brain, uh, it really is unbelievable uh, how much we can see inside. There are uh, experiments where you can tether a fly, uh, watch it from above, sometime even con sometimes even connect little probes and watch it as it walks. Um, there are experiments to track the fly legs uh, in arenas. There are experiments that do this automatically by essentially using machine learning techniques to pack out these uh, types of coordinates. This is a beautiful way of also segmenting the behaviors. So you watch a fly and instead of having a graduate student or undergrad catalog, oh, now they're eating, now they're foraging, now they're grooming, you have computer techniques that can learn how to recognize these behaviors and start to see the map of behaviors and how they transition from one behavior to another. And of course, beautiful experiments for 
watching uh, these flies as they fly either in a tethered or uh, free prep um, and then see how they behave uh, um, as they are perturbed or genetically manipulated. And finally, um, we now, thanks to the folks at Genalia, have a complete electro um, EM uh, reconstruction of the entire brain and ventral nervous cord of the fly. And so within a year or two, we will know all of the connections between all of the neurons in the fly. It's been a massive undertaking and a real coup for the folks at the HHMI. And now we can do those tracing experiments following neurons from uh, a sensory apparatus all the way to um, the actual musculature. So with that, I'll leave you with some of the resources and I'll end there and take any uh, questions that you might have. Thank you, Itai, for a great tutorial. So I will ask you two questions from the chat and then we will go over, you know, we will start the 15 minute discussion where we go over questions from both talks. So this question is from Ashok Prasad and he asks, uh, do we understand at all how the neurons do the calculations? Um, th there are lots of cases where, um, uh, um, for example, there are neural circuits that have been figured out for how to do integration. Um, the thing that's problematic is that uh, those circuits are relatively slow. And so the question in this particular case of doing the integral, the proportional part, I think people think comes directly from the Haltier displacement. The question is how do you do the integral part? And you could do it in a number of ways. You could have a crappy um, low pass filter, which would uh, essentially give you integration. Another possibility is that there's a piece of the Haltier that if you took um, sensory information from the Haltier as it deformed, uh, maybe one of the surfaces on the Haltier is actually giving you the integral part, is acting like a crappy integrator. And that would be enough to just take neurons from there and pipe them directly into the motor neuron and the muscle. So we don't know how it's being done in the ventral nervous cord of the fly, um, but there are certainly circuits that have been figured out in other animals for integration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the next question is from Dylan Steer, and he asks, do some of these cluster connections break when decapitated? Uh, beyond the head ones, example, for example, if a cluster has a wing, leg, and head clustered connection, does that connection hold once decapitated, or is that known? I don't know what, uh, so how should I say it? The, the clustering that we did was on the neural architecture. So um, the, the question that I think you're asking is, in a live fly, or a fly that's been decapitated, would that neural circuit still be functioning? And the answer is that we haven't even determined whether that neural circuit is functioning in an undecapitated fly. So that's the first thing that we gotta do. The, the measurement and mapping out of the neurons and which neurons are close enough that we think they're connected to form a cluster, you still gotta do the hard neuroscience to prove that those neurons are indeed connected to each other, that that circuit is indeed functioning the way we think it should. And that takes a lot of hard neuroscience. What I showed in the clustering is a way of forming hypotheses that we then need to test. Once we show that that circuit uh, is functioning the way that we think it does, then comes your question of what happens when we decapitate. And there the issue is that if you don't get the signal from the descending neuron, it's hard to see how to activate that circuit. So you could go in directly with a probe or you could go in with an electrode and try to stimulate that circuit and trigger it. But um, you know, if you permanently damage the descending neuron so that it can't fire, then it may, you may have disabled that, uh, that um, program. That doesn't mean that you can't activate it in some other way, but we really need to do the hard neuroscience of working through those hypotheses, working through that neuroscience, and that's kind of uh, the work that the people in the field are doing. 